All right. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our 12th ArcPost webinar and the second part of our series on ArcPost geographical data. Today's topic, we will build on themes from last month as we focus on georeferencing and managing localities of ArcPost. Presenting for us today are Michelle Tu from MDZ, Tom Zierikowski from MSC, and Andrew Dahl from CMS. If you didn't catch part one of the series in October, you can access the recording at arcpost.org slash learn slash webinars. Uh, we'll also have today's recording posted in the next day or two for you to actually share. Uh, before we get started, here are some resources to help you better navigate ArcPost. Um, and at the bottom of your screen, there are some links to our handbook specifically related to ArcPost localities and give overviews of how geography is structured in the database, as well as several helpful step-by-step -step tutorials on managing localities. Um, and I also want to mention that the last webinar of the year will be on ArcPost taxonomy. It will take place here on Adobe Connect on Tuesday, December 11th. So mark the calendar, and hopefully we'll see you there. With that, um, Michelle will do a quick review of the spatial stack discussed in last month's, month's webinar. Um, and to those of you listening, just a reminder, if you have um, any questions, feel free to ask us in the chat box during the webinar, and we'll try to answer those as they come, and we'll also save time for Q&A at the end. All right, Michelle. All right, thank you, Emily. Can everyone hear me all right? Yep. Uh, I hope so. Um, let's see, I just wanted to uh, review one of the slides that uh, has a figure that kind of helps uh, illustrate the relationship between the spatial tables in Arctos. So the first one, as um, you may recall, is our higher geography. We spent a little bit of time talking about this uh, last month. Um, this is a code table controlled um, with community prioritized uh, sort of geography table that handles the continent, the country, the state, or province, um, and sometimes even the county or sub-provincial units uh, for at any given locality. And those are shared across all of Arctos. And many localities um, obviously uh, can share uh, a single higher geography. Um, <clears throat> those um, are related directly with localities. Uh, this is um, the coordinates for mapping. This is where we store our geographic uncertainty, elevation, depth, and um, remarks. Um, we will demonstrate uh, how locality uh, localities in the locality table can be edited, um, and specifically using geolocate to uh, assign coordinates. Um, we'll also see how you can bulk load localities and clean up duplicate uh, localities. Um, and that all happens in this particular table. Um, the, each locality is associated with a specific date, and that is stored in the collecting event. Um, each collecting event then is assigned to a specific specimen in a specimen event um, uh, identifier. So the last demonstration will be specifically looking at how we create specimen events and how we edit and um, update collecting events um, for multiple specimens. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Tom, who will demonstrate um, uh, georeferencing and editing localities in the locality table. Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So. I'm going to, as Michelle said, I'm going to start out by doing some simple things here um, on uh, localities in Orcos with some specimens that have already snooped around our own database and using my own specimen as an example to start with. So can everybody see the screen fairly well? Yes? Yeah. OK, good. Thanks for confirmation. So. As you can see, here's a list of specimens of uh, the Arizona toad, the toad that um, I have done some research on with some colleagues uh, the last few years. And there's one specimen here um, that does not have any coordinates uh, associated with it. So um, the specimen collected back in the 3rd of April. So uh, I'm going to pick uh, 
the specimen from the list. Um, have some. I customized my screen to sort of show the collector number and uh, the verbal description of the locality. It says in Pond of County Road 22, called the local road, E tank number one, Catherine County, New Mexico. So, um, in order for us to associate um, coordinates with this, I'm gonna try to um, use the geolocate app within the uh, Arctos, uh, or built into the Arctos interface. So um, if I click on the locality, and go in and edit the locality directly, uh, and um, right now, uh, if I look at the locality itself, again, it's the higher geography that's associated with this, it's Catron County, specific locality, I mentioned before, it's described as in Pond of County Road 2, local road, tank number 1. Um, there is no, currently no coordinates associated with it. Um, and then the service itself uh, gets some coordinates. So if you look to the right here, it says web service lookup data. Uh, data in this box comes from web services. and they're not specimen data. They're derived from automated processes. So oftentimes this gets us within some uh, reasonable areas. And if I check on this, uh, it gets us in the area, but not really to where the tanks are. So what I'm going to do is go in and your reference with geolocate. Geolocate, most of you are probably familiar with the service. It's a um, application built uh, Nelson Rios mainly at well, he was at Tulane, um, and this is now linked directly to the service, linked directly to the Arctic. Now, right off the bat. Um, the application gives us two possible locations, one based on pattern local mountain and another one based on pattern Cooney. Cooney is a very common name used for a variety of canyons and mountains in the region. So uh, the local mountain is a bit more precise and um, for the area. So if I start zooming in, um, Obviously, Lalka Mountain Road goes quite close to the quite close to a mountain, and if I um, start looking around, well, I'm familiar with the area, so that um, helps. But this is Road 22, crosses Cooney Prairie. And as I zoom in closer, I'm able to look up finer topographic um, maps. Uh, of course, the Google uh, Geolocate app application has a, diff a variety of base layers. You can use Google Earth Maps, Earth Maps, Topo, some open source maps, MapNIC, and so forth. The USGS topo maps are probably the most appropriate and easiest because they do show uh, extremely well all the details of the topography. So you can see I've gotten to the area of Loka Mountain Road, um, Road 22, the county road, um, and where the Cooney tanks are. And now I have a latitude longitude for a point and also the certainty associated with it. And I can modify both. And as I zoom closer and closer, I can actually put the point right on the tank and edit the uncertainty to match the, uh, the extent of the tank. This tank is actually fairly small. 
fairly small as well. So here I am. I narrow it down to latitude and longitude, certainly about 60 meters. Really happy with this view reference. So all I have to do is the only button here, save to your application. Once I do that, uh, all the fields get automatically populated. Um, you know, the decimal latitude, longitude gets transferred, maximum error, as well as the datum, the source of the georeferencing, and the source of the application. Once I do that, I can save these edits to the locality. And now, uh, if I reload the specimen associated with that locality, it'll map uh, properly to exactly the uh, pond I selected. You can see that both the latitude and longitude as well as the error are represented in these Another quick example I want to show you is how to modify the locality. Um, and this is um, a specimen I noticed had a problem. I noticed this uh, a few days ago. Um, here's a specimen that was collected back in 1982 by Ed Brown. Um, it's a snake from uh, Oklahoma. And the only description that was on the uh, tag that Clean Creek Lake Marlow. Well, as we can tell, uh, Marlow is a town in uh, Oklahoma, uh, and Clean Creek Lake uh, is very close to this town. So uh, one of the students put a point on there. Unfortunately, to me, it looks like they essentially put a point in the sort of southern part of the lake and didn't really bother with uh, um, any sort of error that would match the extent of the lake. So very much like, like in the previous example, I can go into the individual record for the specimen. And even though all the reality shows is OK, I'm not very happy with this reference. So in order to modify this, the same thing where I'll edit the reality. And uh, and there's a service suggested modification in the southern part of Oklahoma. You notice these fields are already filled. But I can go in and modify the coordinates here with the location as well. There's the town of Marlow, as I mentioned before. And I have a couple of options uh, in Geolocate 2. I can um, not only move this coordinates to the middle of the lake and edit the uncertainty to, um, so that it encompasses the extent of the lake on this topo map. Um, but I can also draw a polygon. And that would encompass the extent of the lake in a bit more precise way. Of course, I can take um, different things. This is just for illustration purposes. But notice what's happening is that we're receiving the latitude and longitude of the point that I moved, the associated uncertainty, and this is the radius, about 2,000 meters. And then I also get an error polygon. And all of that gets saved to the application in this case, Arctos. So now I have, I have the, still going? Um, so now I can, I can associate, right, this right, um, yeah, I click through this too fast. Um, So 
what I'm able to do is also also uh, use this this uh, description of the polygon um, as a as a well-known text format polygon. Do that, and some of you are probably more familiar with, uh, with the uh, um, with uh, well-known text from other GIS sources. But there is a way to describe uh, um, an area with well-known text. So if I do that, I can have both the latitude, longitude, the error associated with it, and the well-known text in here. So if I save these edits, um, again, just like in the previous examples, once that locality is saved, I can reload the uh, specimen information. And now I'll have a very different description of that lake. So those are two examples of uh, of both just making that uh, georeferencing based on the description and using geolocate for that, and then using geolocate to modify coordinates and copy uh, modify the coordinates and copy the well-known text polygon into the locality descriptions. All right. All right. Thanks, Andy. Can I move us to bulk loading localities with specimens? All right. Um, yeah. So, bulk loading specimens is a great way to um, get your data into ArcGIS. Um, when you're bulk load specimens and you're using um, uh, new locations, the bulk loader will create new localities from the data that you upload. Um, so you can do it all in one simple step. Um, you can also go to, you can go and create the localities one at a time, um, create locality here. Um, if it's something you're going to be using over and over again, um, you can do it that way. But uh, bulk loading is very efficient. Um, we get a lot of specimens from very specific localities, um, and it's usually just kind of a one-off thing. It, uh, we have an extensive salvage program, and people bring us uh, a dead bird that hit their window, for example, or um, actually we get a lot of our specimens from wildlife rehab centers. Um, so what we get is a lot of addresses. Um, so this is what our bug bulk loader sheet looks like. Um, you can get the template for this from the bulk loader builder. Um, but this is this verbatim locality column here. This is the data that we get. Um, so we go through and enter all this in the spreadsheet. Um, we then reformat it for our specific locality. So it's um, in the same standard format with um, increasing resolution. So we have the cities first and then the actual address. Um, but if you're not careful doing this bulk loading, uh, it's a good chance to upload a bunch of junk or um, it's a good way of duplicating localities if you're not careful. Um, so there's a couple things that I use to prevent that. Um, first of all, I ha always have a tab of um, common localities that we get a lot of specimens from. Um, sometimes it's ones with poor data, like we just have one from Ease or Estes Park. Um, those have been created in ArcGIS previously. They have a, 
uh, locality ID. So um, you can just copy that and then drop it into your um, bulk loader data sheet. Where's all my data? Um, anyway, um, so so we, we double check for any um, common localities um, down here at the bottom. We got three different birds that all came from Wash Park. Each one came in with a different way of saying Wash Park, um, but they were all four. Uh, Washington Park here in Denver, so we know that. I got that locality ID from our list over there, and then we drop that uh, into our locality ID column here. And uh, with that, I don't have to I don't have to enter coordinates for it. Um, we just leave those blank. Um, I don't have to enter the uncertainty or elevation. That all will, it's already attached to lo that locality, so that will be attached to the specimen when we do the bulk upload. Um, another thing we do to um, standardize and make sure that things upload right, um, we generally get the county with these addresses. Uh, so we can't just enter county uh, in the bulk letter. You have to enter the higher geography string. Um, so we have uh, a list here for each county in Colorado. Most of our stuff comes from Colorado where we can look up just the county name and it will input the county string. Uh, so that will give us uh, the same entry every time. Um, we also use drop downs in a few places for uh, different uh, defined names in ArcDelos like decimal degrees, uh, the types of error, things like that. Uh, so doing things like that to prevent um, duplicating localities is helpful. Um, with addresses like this, it can be um, very time consuming to get uh, specific coordinates for all of these. So we use an online tool um, for looking up addresses uh, and getting coordinates for them. So you can just copy your list of um, localities. Uh, and the tool that we use is uh, this GPS visualizer here. Um, it's pretty handy. You can use a couple of different services to look up coordinates. This is the work. You can use MapQuest, Bing, or Google. I tend to default to Google because I like Google. Um, you can you then paste in your addresses. And um, for Google, you have to have an API key. Uh, you can apply for a key uh, with this link right here. Um, you can do up to a thousand uh, localities a day with that. Uh, if you need more, you can contact Google. But uh, you put that in there, you um, select Google, and then hit start geocoding, and then Google starts looking up through its databases specific coordinates for all those addresses. <coughs> Down here, uh, once it's done, you tell it to you want a, a map. Um, the way we do it, we get a KML file or KMZ uh, for Google Earth. So once it's done, it's done. Um, you click that, click Draw Map, and it will produce the KMZ for you to download. Um, I've done that previously. Then you can open it up in Google Earth, and you can see all your data right there. Um, all of these specimens I know we got from Colorado, so. Uh, these two outliers here are going to be something I will have to look at specifically. Um, but then as a method of quality control, um, we sort through this list looking at each one and seeing that it actually seems appropriate for the address given. Um, like this one here in Longmont, landed right on the house on Ajax Way. That one's probably good. Um, we'll do a quick measurement to uh, get our air radius. Um, and then you can also get your elevation down here in the bottom right corner, 1522 meters. Uh, so then that would then be entered in here, our air, and then elevation and 
maximum elevation would go in here. If it's a, a large air radius, I do do a elevation range, um, but for most of the houses, it's generally uh, just a single elevation. Um, yeah, so you flip through all these, checking to see if they're real. Um, sometimes, even though Google returns some coordinates, it's um, kind of garbage coordinates. Um, oftentimes, if that address doesn't exist, it will just drop it in the street near that, where that address might possibly be. Um, so you have to look out for, like, if you have a point just kind of in the middle of the road, you might have to double check that. Um, what I use oftentimes um, for checking those addresses are the county assessor offices uh, websites. Um, some of them are better than others uh, for sure, but they typically have some sort of property search and you can uh, type in an address and look it up. You can see exactly where the boundaries of that uh, address are so you can make an appropriate error circle. Um, once there's an additional step which I guess I breezed over. Um, you have a KMZ file, but you want to get um, the actual coordinates here. Um, you can use that same GPS visualizer service uh, to um, convert that KMZ file into a text file so you can um, so you can input that into your spreadsheet and you would do that here just on the main GPS visual, visualizer.com. Um, you would choose that KMZ file, tell it you want a plain text table and then tell it to convert it. And you get it in a nice um, a text file that you can then paste into your Excel file for uploading. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our process for getting all the data that we need um, for localities before the upload. Um, after you have uploaded stuff, occasionally we get stuff where we did duplicate it. Um, for example, um, I mean, over the course of years, it may be the same person brings in a dead animal to us um, and we do a bulk upload on each time and we may have entered it slightly differently. Um, so there's a way in Arctos for you to merge localities um, that are duplicated or you can search for them and merge them. Uh, that's under, um, let me find a good example. Locality. So this locality here, uh, Longmont, 645 years highway, you can see it's in Arctos four different times, um, just minor differences in the data tied to it. This one doesn't have an error, this one has 65 meters, 70, 120. Uh, you can click on these maps and it will bring up Berkeley Mapper. Um, for you to see where these are taking you. Um, I usually open them all up in series, zoom in and see where they're at. Um, this is actually the real locality here. Um, this first one was nearby, but not actually that close to where it was. So um, to merge these all, you would pick which one is, is the best, and maybe they're all a little off. You can go in and you can edit them um, using the link here. Um, but this one, from my checking earlier, I know this is the one that I want to use. So you can do check for duplicates. I want to merge all of them into this one. Um, so they all have the same specific locality, so I'm going to leave that. But the coordinates were a little bit different. So if you just type ignore 
into that field um, and over any of the fields that you want. Uh, you know there might be differences and you want them all to be together. You just hit ignore in there. And it will then do a search for anything that matches what is in these fields, which all I left in here was the specific locality and the higher geography. So then you would hit filter table below. It re refreshes. And then here, these are those other three which are inappropriate. Uh, you can click them all. Um, or if um, you realize from some of the data here that one of these is intentionally supposed to be a little bit different, you could uncheck that one and not merge them all. But I want these all to go into the one, so then I click on Merge Checked Localities. And then that should do it. There's nothing left down in the table here. Um, so you can go back to your search and verify that they actually have merged appropriately. And we only get one result. So we've taken those four localities down to one. So it saved us a little disk space um, and confusion in our uh, locality tables. Uh, the final thing I wanted to cover real quickly for uh, cleaning up data is um, this cool little tool for um, dealing with higher geography. Um, so let's say I want to um, see all the specimens that are in Bent County. Well, you can bring out the Bent County um, geography page. And you can see there's all of these specimens associated with this higher geography. Um, but when you look at the map, you see that um, there's some outliers here that are outside of the county border. Uh, well, there's this nifty little tool here, this link, it says find specimens with coordinates outside the WKT, WKT shape. Uh, you click on that and it will do a search of all everything that's outside of that boundary um, that is tied to that county. Um, and we've got 21, so I've got some work to do to clean these up. Um, so you could go through and decide um, for each one, should that have been a different county or do I have bad coordinates or what was the deal there? Um, a lot of these are older uh, specimens, 1939. Uh, that led me to question, I know that boundaries change um, over time. So maybe this actually had been Bent County back in 1939 and that's why it got in there as it is. Um, I just want to show you one little uh, cool thing I found, this atlas of historical county bound boundaries. Um, you can look look at the boundary changes over time um, in your particular state. So I can select Colorado, view interactive map, and it should, there we go. Um, so originally when the state was founded, it was just one big state, and then they split it into counties, and the counties changed over time. So you can use this with your historical specimens to look for um, explanations of why your county doesn't match up with maybe the coordinates or the locality that you were you found on the tag with the specimen. So, um, yeah, that's about all I have. Michelle, you want to take it back over? Yeah, here, I'll uh, request control. While we're switching screens here, are there any questions for what we uh, just saw? We have, we're, we're right on schedule, amazingly. <laughs> um, so let's see if I can. Any questions? OK. Well, um, we'll cover more questions at the end. Thanks a lot, um, Tom and Andy. Those, that was really, really great. Um, and uh, we'll have, uh, hopefully, Andy, you can also share those links in the, in the chat afterwards. That, that county, historic county boundaries is pretty fascinating. 
Um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is uh, walk through a specific example that we deal with a lot in the MVZ, specifically um, having to do with um, historic locality. So it's sort of a, a nice segue there with the historic county boundary. So um, in this case, um, I'm going to back up here to our field notes, uh, which are uh, most of our field notes that are prior to 1940s, I believe, um, are digitized and available through our eco-reader interface. Um, so I've been dealing with some of the uh, listed frog species in California, specifically with um, red-legged frogs. And so this led me down to investigate some of the, the site, historic sightings. So um, this specific uh, example um, is really um, uh, one that's typical in a lot of databases with uh, long historic, um, uh, with you know, a large amount of historic um, data. So it, in this case, uh, our specimens may have been um, uh, sort of um, uh, georeferenced through either HerpNet or one of the other projects um, in the past, but that was without access to either the uh, knowing the specimen or knowing um, anything about the field notes. So what was flagged immediately um, by this researcher looking at red-legged frogs, let me see if I can find the example here. Um, so when we look at um, these red-legged frogs, by the way, here's a Berkeley mapper trick here. Um, I'm going to hold down my shift key and draw a box here. There we go. And zoom in here. And you can see that the specimen here uh, had a locality that was mapped to downtown Point Bray Station. Um, and uh, it's this particular um, specimen right here, which was part of a series um, from 1922. So the uh, researcher um, was a little bit suspicious because it's the specific locality actually said near Point Bray Station, not actually downtown Point Bray Station. And yet our database had it mapped to downtown Point Bray Station. So that to me signals more. It was a, a, leg a matter of legacy uh, georeferencing. And the georeferencer didn't necessarily do anything wrong. They followed the protocol. But um, nonetheless, um, when it's mapped out and you want it to be useful to um, researchers, it's not very useful. So um, dipping into the field notes, like I said, um, I was able to find the specific day that Tracy Store was visiting um, Marin County, California on August 26, 1922, and found a reference to uh, the specific, uh, his activities on that day, and specifically to the Rana Drayton I um, Young that he collected. Interestingly, he actually did not um, do, he did not uh, write it down in any kind of catalog. So you can see, like, the, I'm just kind of flipping through a few pages, um, and it's just text. So um, it was only through the careful reading that I could see that he actually did collect a few. He found them and collected them. Um, and it's reflected in our database through this specimen list right here. So let's dig right back into um, a specimen. And now, I could have picked any one of these, by the way, but I'm going to, I just picked the first one because I know that they are sharing the same locality, or luckily in this case, they are sharing the locality. And just like, um, Tom did in his example of uh, editing a locality, I'm going to click on this um, locality tag uh, tab, which pulls up our specimen event. Now, he went over and edited the locality directly, um, which I could do as well. But in this particular case, because we have this legacy specimen event, in this case, I actually want to add another specimen event, because I don't necessarily want to um, remove the prior legacy um, association with that um, Point Ray station. Because that may be an important breadcrumb for some future researcher to understand that at one point, we too had um, associated with this uh, legacy locality. So instead, I'm going to um, open up the specimen event tab um, and uh, you can see the um, 
the things that are uh, uh, noted right here. So it's the vet determiner was the georeferencer, and this was uh, determined in 2002. So actually, I happen to know that this, uh, given that date, that this was uh, probably georeferenced during the Manus, um, NSF Manus project. And um, these are those, and it hasn't been actually looked at. It's still unverified. And it has a collecting event association with all three of, uh, sorry, all six herp specimens, all the six frogs. That um, he actually mentioned uh, that he collected six. And um, so instead, I am going to add a specimen event. So in this case, you can um, look up yourself um, and um, use the tab key to uh, pull up um, a, uh, a code, you know, um, controlled uh, 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 agent. Um, it has today's date. Um, this is uh, a specimen event. So um, um, I'm going to actually just leave that blank for now. And uh, there's some other information that I can actually add in from the field notes. Um, well, I, I can go ahead and just do that right now. So in the specimen event, um, I can write down that this is uh, something that I verified um, from field notebook. Let me just uh, grab that specific reference here. So that's the specific page. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time um, reading it out to you, but I'll, I'll mention that he actually pointed out that he found the um, the six Rana Drake and I, uh, in freshwater marshes at the head of Tamales Bay. And he described that these ponds were along the sloughs and on the heavy carpet of water weeds. There I found the young of Rana Drake and I. So that's a direct quote from the field notes. Um, which uh, are actually listed right here. So I had pointed this out earlier. Um, he also mentioned that he wasn't able to find them at 2 o'clock when the sun was strong, but he went back um, afterwards with a flashlight and caught them. Six frogs in about 15 minutes. So there's a lot of details here that obviously don't really belong in, um, in, our, in, our, um, in our specimen event remark, except for habitat. So I'm going to actually... Uh, point that out here. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, put that down as a uh, short form. So, um, and the collecting source is wild caught. And I'm going to leave this blank for now. Um, and I'm going to pick a um, collecting event, because I still want this associated with the collecting event. So I can see up here my collecting event information. So actually, I'm just going to use that. Um, and sorry, you can't see my pick list right now, but I have a pick list open. Um, and I'm going to just um, put in near point raise station, which is uh, and I'm going to look for my matches. And it should be pretty easy because um, I only have uh, a few of them, and there's only going to be one for August uh, uh, 26, 1922. So once I have that, that gets um, populated into my near point ray station. So now I'm ready to create a specimen event. So let's go ahead and click this. And um, so now I have specimen event. Um, and you can see that it's got all the information that I have inputted before. Um, I'm not sure why it says seven specimens. It should say only six. So let's get into edit our vocabulary. I think that's some kind of weird. I'm not even sure why it says seven. Um, oh, I know why it says, sorry. Those are seven specimen events because I have not edited um, the prior specimen events. So don't, we're not, we're going to fix that at the end. So don't worry about that. Um, so right now what I want you to notice is that um, this is the same locality at the previous specimen event. So um, when I go to back to my specimen event tables, let's just do that real fast here, uh, you'll see that um, 
this is uh, also uh, ends in 974, okay? And so this is 974. So that's the same specimen event. So we, we don't necessarily want to remove that because that's a, that's a new one. Um, so we can actually go ahead and clone this locality, creating a brand new um, locality. Uh, it'll ask you if you are sure about that, and, and we are. And so we get a brand new locality, and you'll see it's a brand new number. And actually, this is a new one that hasn't been used, so there's no other specimens associated with it. And it has the same, because it's a clone, it has the same information, that now I am free to edit and change around. And um, for the sake of time, we're going to just take a look at a locality that I actually already created and added some uh, new specific inf uh, locality information pulled directly from the field notes. And so instead of having my near point ray station, I just amended it that with head of Tamales Bay along the creek drainage, which again is straight from the field notes. Um, I can uh, uh, read you a reference this again, uh, ex exactly the same way that Tom showed us, where we are going to modify the coordinates. And um, so there's some nice uh, um, benefits to doing that because now I can verify that my point, instead of being in Point Ray Station as the previous one, I dr I've dragged it and created it near the end of the um, uh, Alima uh, Creek. I'll show you a, a nice new feature in Geolocate. You can actually add in um, hydrogra uh, hydrography to indicate um, some of the water features that might be relevant. So I use that to just verify that this was a Lima Creek and there are sort of ponds and sag ponds and, and a wetlands area to the west of um, Point Ray Station. And here's Langernitas Creek coming in. And since he, he in other parts of the field notes, um, seem pretty clear that the um, red-legged frogs were associated with the Lima Creek and not Langonitas Creek. I'm going to keep it to this side of Lima Creek and the um, San Sir Francis Drake Boulevard. So, um, so I'm pretty happy with that. And I'm going to close that because I've already created that. And now that I'm more or less um, satisfied with this new locality, I'm going to just copy this locality ID and go, come back here to my locality. And um, so now I'm back in my specimen. Um, sorry, this is not the right one. Uh, I'm back here, yes, with my uh, specimen event table. And um, this is my old locality that um, I don't, again, I don't want to necessarily delete. But I do want to reassociate now this new specimen event with this new locality. So I can edit this locality and, um, oops, sorry, I think I, let me go back here. Uh, so now this is the, this is the, the uh, tricky part. I don't want to edit the locality, I've already edited it. But what I do need to do is um, uh, change the collecting event. So this is, uh, this is where it gets a little bit confusing because actually the locality has been made, but what it hasn't ha uh, what we haven't done yet is uh, reassociate it with that date. And so now we actually need to edit the collecting event. So that's the, um, the, the tricky part. So uh, we're going to come down to editing uh, events and we can I'll share it. Well, let me just open up um, edit, editing the look event. Um, and so now this is everything in the edit, uh, the collecting event table. And you can see now we have access to the verbatim locality, the verb verbatim date, um, and uh, the verbatim coordinates. And instead here, I'm going to pick a new locality for this collecting event. So I can, do, I can go in here. And um, in my clipboard, I've actually copy-pasted in the new locality ID. And so that's just a, a handy way to use the locality ID number uh, to find it um, quickly. Um, 
just a FYI, these locality ID numbers um, are actually semi-permanent IDs. They're, they're automatically generated by the Oracle database, but they don't necessarily have permanent. So you don't want to use them for long-term um, referencing, but you can use them for, uh, for just these sorts of day-to-day um, -day, um, activities. So here's my head of Tomales Bay, Alima Creek Drainage, near Point Ray Station. Um, and here's a little snapshot so I know I've got the right one. And I accept that. And um, I haven't saved anything, so now I can um, save this. Go back to uh, this. And it has uh, the new locality which I can verify here on my, on my right here. And then I can save this. And, and then we can go back to our um, herp specimens here. And now, if you see, this one actually has two events. So we're going to go take care of that right now. So here we go. Um, and this is sort of the last one uh, from that uh, um, last step is to verify these specimen events. So um, here's the specimen event, or the prior specimen event, and it has unverified. So I'm going to switch this to unaccepted and save that. And I'm going to um, switch this one to accepted. But it's actually, I'm going to, accepted definitely makes it um, the one that will be mapped. But in this case, I, I've actually spent a little bit of time researching this, and so I kind of want to verify it and lock it. So. And so when you do these, you know, you will be um, affecting, you know, you can affect one or more specimens. So you need to pay attention. That's what the big red box is uh, for you to pay attention to that. Um, there are still seven, but it's really referencing the fact that I've got seven different specimen events uh, here. Um, now, there are definitely situations where people will have um, uh, more than one specimen event. Uh, we showed that in uh, examples um, in our previous webinar. Uh, for instance, when uh, you take in repeated sampling from an individual um, uh, a living collection, obviously something that um, allows you to take uh, multiple blood specimens, uh, blood samples, for example. So you may have actually multiple specimen events. So there are definitely uh, situations where um, one is, doesn't assume that there's only a single specimen event per um, specimen. So a couple of other things I'd like to mention. Um, so here we can go back and. Um, round this out and take a look at where this, where this uh, refresh this. And so now when we refresh this, you'll see that um, the, uh, the, uh, my box around the location has changed because it's been verified and locked. And the box um, around my georeference is also green because um, my point falls within the higher geography. And it actually has a very tiny little um, spot there. Um, and then the previous uh, uh, specimen event has been grayed out uh, to show that it's no longer accepted. Um, so a couple of words I'm going to uh, just mention really briefly, and then we'll open it up for some quick questions. Uh, specimen event determiner. Uh, there were some um, questions about who, guidelines and who, who is the specimen event determiner. Well, in this case, I put myself, because I did the um, the legacy work um, of tightening up the, the georeferencing and, um, and did the research on the field notes. But there are other instances where um, the collector who may provide the specific locality information, especially if they supply the coordinates either through a GPS or from maps, then the collector should be um, the event determiner. Um, if the event determiner uh, uh, or rather, if the collector is not available um, and a student uh, was the, the one who assigned the coordinates through either a large uh, legacy project like Manus or through some other um, project, then the student's name should be the specimen event determiner. Uh, so 
those are a couple of examples um, where uh, where the event determiner isn't um, necessarily uh, predestined, but just some situations where um, we've uh, we've through either uh, protocols or guidelines, you know, have uh, different kinds of assessment event determiners. Um, and I think that's pretty much uh, all I have to show. Um, a couple of other notes. Um, I'll mention that um, if you notice at the very bottom here, we actually have uh, quite a, a bit of information on um, on uh, uh, geology. Where's my geology here? There we go. Um, which we don't actually have time to discuss. So we're going to um, probably uh, have that in another webinar and have people who use the geology tables more often. That, that definitely deserves its own webinar. And um, another, another uh, aspect that I want to mention is that um, we, each one of us, uh, had to be logged in to uh, uh, alter any of the specimen event information. But there are instances where Arctos, um, uh, Arctos shares tables across all the uh, collections. And so those situations um, uh, would be the uh, higher geography. If people need new higher, kinds of higher geographies or have a question about higher geography, and that's the sort of thing that um, goes to the entire Arctis community. And we have protocols for that. Um, we have GitHub issue and ways to communicate. Um, and likewise, there are localities that can be shared across uh, multiple collections. And so there's just some general etiquette uh, guidelines to that. Um, basically, don't change localities willy-nilly. <laughs> and uh, we're going to develop uh, more of those localities and have those posted. Um, but for each one of our specimens, you'll see that there's um, ways to report or annotate um, or comment on um, uh, specimens and localities. And those get sent to the data quality contacts for each of those collections. So if you have a desire to change those localities um, that also happen to be shared by another collection, then this is one method that you can do um, to communicate that before you start doing uh, something. or um, the easiest thing to do is just not do it um, and clone the locality uh, before you alter it um, for your own collection. Um, but those are some of the, the aspects that are a little bit unique to Arctis. Um, so with that, I can pass it on to um, the, uh, to Emily and um, open it up for questions. Yeah, and I just enabled everyone's microphones. If you'd like to ask a question, go ahead. And I will uh, copy and paste the post-webinar survey. Um, just a reminder for you, it's really helpful for us to know your feedback on these webinars. So please, please take two minutes to fill it out after we're done. Any questions? That was really helpful. Um, I'll just say that. I, I learned a lot there. Um, yeah, thank you. If anyone's chatting. Mary, it looks like Mary Beth has a question. Oh, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question, actually. When you're um, entering coordinates, on like a data entry record, and it's like GPS, you know, from the collector. Um, what do you put for georeferencing protocol since they're, you know, collector provided coordinates? You know, where it asks um, uh, geolocate, Google automated, not recorded, Manus. Yeah. Guideline. So when I, um, whenever I am supplying um, uh, uncertainty estimates. Uh, preferably in meters, I tend to use the MANUS georeferencing guidelines because that was the first protocol that we that established um, uncertainty in meters in the point radius method. So, um, so that's what I tend to use. Um, Sometimes uh, it's 
work think the SORAS, especially for things that are uh, coming from like the USGS GeoNames database, where you know the USGS sort of has has a long history of recognizing place names, right? So if it's the particular place names or like a town or a lake or something, that's you know, and if you're not using the Manus or the ERPNet. Right, but if they're GPS coordinates, then I still use the Manus Georeferencing Guidelines um, mm -hmm. because I'm using some, I'm in including some uncertainty estimate. Okay. And if I don't get an uncertainty estimate uh, for a GPS unit, then I will assign um, a default 30 meter um, right. Max error, which again follows the Manus Georeferencing Guidelines. Okay, that makes sense. I think Vicki has a question. I think people can can use their microphones too. Yeah, go ahead. Feel free. I thought I wrote it down. A question for Andy. Oh, Andy, when you bulk load localities, um, in the cases where you have a locality ID already, um, do you have to actually enter a specific locality on your bulk loader sheet, or can you just enter the ID and not have to fill in those fields? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, we always put it in because this is kind of like one of our backups and go-to spots and we want to look at um, data that we've entered if we're trying to sure. what we did. Um, but I think I think you probably don't have to. I think as long as you have the locality ID in there, it just links the specimen event uh, to that locality. Um, yeah. So you don't need any of this. I know I put in the coordinates before. I copy and paste them out of Arctos and put them in. Um, it, it doesn't cause any problems to have it in there, right. but I know I can leave them out and it gets associated just fine. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right. Looks like Vicki has a question. Um, is there a way to batch georeference localities at the same time with geolocate besides picking out each specimen from the results table? Oh, I see what you're, so you're saying to batch georeference. Um, well, there is a batch georeference um, uh, uh, function in geolocate, but you have to remember that geolocate is what we re think of as a semi-automated um, uh, georeferencing tool um, because, you know, it can, it can pick out more than one um, uh, set of coordinates um, after it's parsed out your locality. And oftentimes you have to do a, a fair bit of like, you know, um, manipulation of the, of the description so it parses slightly differently or, you know, you end up moving the point visually and adjusting the uncertainty visually. So, um, so right now there isn't a way to do that via Arctos. You could do that independently through the, the geolocate workbench. Um, but that usually requires sort of sending um, the geolocate folks and um, a contact, um, you know, contacting them so they can bulk load your, your uh, spreadsheet and work from there. And even then, what you're doing is having geolocate batch georeference, um, but in the case of geolocate finding more than one set of coordinates for your description, um, some person has to go through and like pick out the favored um, set of coordinates, um, and then geolocate can uh, can um, export that out as a single um, set of coordinates per specimen or per locality, depending on how you upload it to geolocate's uh, workbench. Um, but th that would be the way to do that if you have a lot of uh, a lot of localities to georeference, you know. Um, fresh. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that was good. Um, any of these any of these procedures, they definitely take a certain amount of quality control. Um, a human's got to look at these things and verify that the computer got the right 
it interpreted what you input correctly. Right. I have one more question before we wrap things up. Um, I, I was curious, just um, Michelle, I know you've had a lot of like student technicians do georeferencing, and I was curious, kind of, um, how you organize like the process. Do you just give them counties or states, or like how do they find what legacy records you know need coordinates? Um, yeah, we we prioritize them by either specific projects that we're working on. So um, mm -hmm. it, it really it really kind of depends. Um, so I actually we we've had some larger projects where um, we're basically just going through localities one by one with field notes research with um, you know another researcher who's actually now is bringing in you know more biological information um, and so that might be a one on one uh, sort of um, uh, project. Or on a more um, routine basis, we actually use a GitHub issue list, and we just email our issues to that list, and then we can prioritize those um, on the issue list, or rather the staff curators can prioritize those on the issue list. So those may be things as easy as just um, make sure that all the coordinates have um, uncertainties uh, associated with them, and then again, we follow the Manus georeferencing guidelines for uh, how to determine the uncertainty. Um, and um, in some cases, it may also be you know a lot of field notebook diving and investigating and contacting collectors to figure out where they were or get more information from them, um, because we have to georeference you know a lot of places from some small. African country that has no base maps, you know, for instance. Um, so that 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 is a more kind of a routine thing. So we don't really, we no longer actually kind of have like a, you know, California County expert or a or a South American sort of regional expert. They have to go everywhere on the map. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. There, is the, there is the option on the main search page to find specimens that aren't georeferenced. Oh. If you want to pull all those out and hand them to a grad student, that's nice and easy. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, typically we don't actually need um, to go look for issues, <laughs> to be honest. We have a lot of priority ones. So the priority ones are like the new incoming accessions. So we try to get, we need to try to grab them before they get explored. But inevitably, when you're fixing one of them, you end up um, finding more problems. And um, so Andy pointed out the um, fine specimens outside the WKT. That is actually mm -hmm. going to be a set of, um, of uh, tasks for um, some of the curatorial assistants that um, I'll be training hopefully next semester. So I was really excited to see that function because um, I can have a couple of students that are, um, you know, sort of learning the ropes, and they can go through those um, really easily. I think. Great, thank you. All right, it looks like we are out of time. Thank you all so much. That was great, and hopefully we'll see you all next webinar on December 11th. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Bye.